Hello, bonjour, good morning, buenos dias, y good on. Um, so I, I want to say that uh, Colleges and Institutes Canada is also the Secretariat of the World Federation of uh, Colleges and Polytechnics, and we are also a centre for UNESCO uh, Univoc. So my presentation must be somewhere. Yes, it's coming. Um, so first, I want to make a, a shout out for two affinity groups that address the issues of equity and diversity. We already have uh, an affinity group for indigenous education and indigenous learners. So if you're interested, uh, go on the website and write to us. We will connect you with the group that had a session here. And I'm pleased to say that we are starting a new one on equity, diversity, inclusion. So you would hear from us uh, in September. So again, it will be on the website. So um, I, I will take a different tact. So I will complement what Jau said. So uh, I decided to start with questions for each of you so that you can ask yourself, what is it that you're doing with respect to equity, diversity, and inclusion? Because as you know, as leaders, Many of us make all kinds of statements saying that we believe in equity, diversity, and inclusion. But let me ask you those questions and answer in your head. So can you meaningfully demonstrate that you do equity, diversity, inclusion in your institution? What are your key performance indicators with respect to EDI? Is your staff diverse? Is your administration diverse? Is your um, faculty diverse and are your students diverse? Do, we, do you provide opportunities for vulnerable populations in your institutions? And if someone else would look at your institutions, what would they say on the same questions? So is it what you do, is it visible? So I, believe, I hope that this presentation that I will need to shorten um, will help you to see what else you can do. Because honestly, we never do enough with respect to equity, diversity, and inclusion. And it is up to each of us to address systemic barriers to inclusion in ways that move beyond good intentions to action. So what does it mean to be inclusive? So I have two questions here, because some of you run institutions or work in institution, post-secondary institutions, but others, you are in association of uh, TVET uh, institution. So let's ask yourself, is your vision talking about creating a better world? Are you an engine for good? Is your organization a positive force in society? And do you have a North Star of what you are aspiring to be with learners? So those are important questions that when you talk about EDI, you need to ask yourself. And if you're not convinced, Generation X, 60% want to work for an organization that want to change the world. So if this is not written in your vision, then you may cut yourself short from a labor uh, perspective with respect to employees. So the global picture, what does it show? Many people talked about all those issues uh, already. I won't talk about them because you all know that we are facing many of the same issues. And the last two years have shown that some people some of the people that Jahu had on her list almost at the end 
of people that are part of the people that are discriminated. We know that during the pandemic, it was worse for them. So what are we doing about that? So I call it the great divide. And in fact, we know that women were more affected. Racialized people were more affected. People that are in, in low, um, low, uh, how do you say, low economic status, unfortunately, they were more affected by COVID because of the, the, the pandemic, but also at, for their jobs. So this brings me also to SDG 9 and SDG 5, because there are 192 countries. So the 42 countries that are represented here, you probably have signed it. So what are we doing with respect to ADI? And I cannot not talk, when I talked about equity, diversity, and inclusion, talk about an intergenerational trauma that happened in my country, in Canada. But guess what? It happened in other countries in the world also. Unfortunately, uh, there were people that uh, the children were taken out of the, their house to be educated. But they lost their heritage. They lost their traditional knowledge for many of them. And it has been traumatic for them and for some of them they cannot even think about school because it hurts, it still hurts. And that's why in our country, we talked a lot about truth and reconciliations because we need to acknowledge those atrocities and we need to do something about it. And as someone said yesterday in the sessions of, uh, in the Indigenous Education Workshop, it all starts by the truth. We have to admit, we have to say what happened so that after we can heal. So this for me, it's SDG 10. Again, most of us here, we have countries that have signed that. And we need to do something about this. The next one is about youth. I didn't hear that a lot this morning. But this is also part of EDI. There are a lot of suffering for the youth right now. We've never seen so many, so many youth suffering of mental health. It has reached proportions that we have never seen. There have been surveys where you see that one out of two people thought about suicide in the last two years. What do we do about this? And this brings me to SDG 3, which is probably one of the most globally preoccupying SDGs right now, because the youth is our future. And we all need to ensure healthy lives and promoting well-being. So I'm going back to the questions that I asked at the beginning. What are you doing with respect to well-being in your institution? Do you care about those youth? What do you do if you do care? And how are the youth supporting each other? Because again, there have been surveys that show that it is with your peers that in fact, you will be better supported. So what can we do? There are things that we can do, and a lot of things. Because we now faced, we are faced with inequalities and we cannot ignore it. We must challenge ourselves. Each of us need to challenge ourselves to confront the systems we know. And if you hear about discrimination at coffee break, or if you take a glass of wine or go to eat pinchos, and you ear discrimination, do you say something about it? If you hear stereotype, do you say something about it? It's our responsibility to do so, to contribute to the educations with respect to ADI. 
The good news is that when we think and we talk about ADI, our TVET institutions are a powerhouse or powerhouses to make change. And imagine if all the TVET institutions of the world would take equity, diversity, and inclusion as something that is a priority in their organizations and use the SDGs as a model and ask ourselves the hard questions. So let me give you some example now. This is our country, my country, Canada. The little purple dots, you may think they are mosquitoes. In fact, they are not mosquitoes, they are the locations of my members. There are 700 of those locations. And the reasons why I'm using this is because I will give some examples of what we've been doing to hopefully inspire, and then you could share with me what you are doing so that together we can do better and we can do more. When you look at this, it's all geolocated, by the way. So if you ever go in Canada, you put the postal code and immediately you'll see all the locations of the campus around. And we can now say that 95% of Canadians live within 50 kilometers of one of our campus. For some of you, 50 kilometers, it's not a long distance, or it is a long distance. For us in Canada, 50 kilometers is just 20 minutes away by car. And 86% of indigenous people live within 50 kilometers of our campus. And we like to say that we are the most accessible post-secondary network in our country because there's no door that is wrong. And no matter what is your background, no matter what you've done before, we will welcome you with open arms. And we know as a fact that for women living in remote communities, we have that in our stats. Statistics Canada, the agency that collects information, has indicated to us that they are uh, colleges and polytechnics are the preferred options for people living in rural areas. Why accessibility? Same thing for displaced workers. They choose a college and an institute to upgrade their skills. I don't mean that nobody is going to universities, but the majority choose colleges. But you know what? I have some statistics that are disturbing from my country. There were people that were, lost their job during the pandemic, and 10% of them decided in the three years that they lost their job, in fact, my statistics are also pre-pandemic the year before, decided to go back to post-secondary, 10%. You know, for me, even if they went more in colleges, for me, it's not good news. What happened to the 90%? What is it that we don't do to attract them? Is it because they didn't know? Is it because they were afraid they would not be accepted? And imagine what it could be in each of our institutions if it, if it would be 100% that come back to upskill or to reskill. So what is it that we do with respect to uh, displaced workers? I'll just give an example of a, a very uh, great um, polytechnic. Big surge of micro-credentials. Big, big surge. And what is happening? We saw that across the country. And we even had the government that announced funding to develop more micro-credentials so that people could share the micro-credentials that were developed. And what is funny is that everybody is excited about micro-credentials. The word may be new, maybe four or five years old, but in TVET, we always had short courses. You know, we just didn't call them micro-credentials. So the good news is that we can continue 
and we can do more. And the other one, I cannot not talk about supporting indigenous students especially. And for us, it is very important because it is part of reconciliation. And I'll just give one example. Part of reconciliation for us is the language revitalization. And already, we have 23 of our colleges that teach indigenous language in our country. And so it's not perfect, but we're getting there. And every year, I see new college that are starting to offer uh, indigenous language. And what is interesting is when non-indigenous decide also to take those courses. We, we had one college, I thought it was quite innovative, College Nordic, it is in the Northwest Territories. And they teach French uh, mainly to Anglophone. But they decided that the course would be to teach French to Anglophone, but um, talking about indigenous uh, knowledge. Ta and so this was very, very clever, very appropriate for the North, and they worked closely with the First Nations in the Northwest Territories. The, the other one is how do we support racialized people and students? So we know that some of our members have, for example, course, specific course to give learners so that they know about the impact of racism, power and privilege, and intersectional, uh, intersectionality of identities. And this is just one example. Because of time, I won't go through all the examples. But uh, we, we have a newsletter where we, we show all the success stories of people. And for me, I need to talk also about women and non-binary and transgender individuals. I'll just give an example because it relates to what Jau said earlier with respect to trades. You remember there were, and we saw some statistics earlier, where women were less in trades when in fact, you can earn very good wages if you go in some specific trades and not only in support services. So at Okanagan College, what they are doing, they are doing a 12-week exploratory program to introduce women to trades, such as carpentry, automotive, plumbing, and electrical, and they explore, and at the end, they can decide if they, which one they will want to pursue, and often, uh, they choose one of those because they feel, wow, I didn't know I had skills, when in fact we all know that skills and trades, there's no gender attached to, uh, to trades. The next one, I can never do a presentation without talking about the sustainable development goals, because for me, when we talked about equity, diversity, and inclusion, they are intimately linked to the SDGs. And for us in our organizations, we focus on SDG 4, 5, 8, 10, and 13. And you, as you can see, and 17, of course, because it's all about partnerships, but uh, the fifth um, SDG 5 is all about gender equality, while uh, SDG 10 is about reducing inequalities, and we feel it's very important. But I think I want to see what's missing on this. And some people may say, oh, wow, how come? You know, there were 192 countries that signed on this, and here she is talking about what's missing. Yes, there are things that are missing, and I want to share them with you, because maybe you can add them also. And the first one for me is aging, because nobody ever talks about it, but it's a huge problem. Maybe not in Africa, but in the rest of the world. It's a very huge, big problem. I was talking with the Basque government uh, 
two days ago, and they said, yes, yes, it is an issue, because who will look after us at one point? We all know that the robots, there are things they won't be able to do uh, for us. So aging, big, big issue, but it's nowhere on the SDGs. The second one is social polarization. We are seeing it more and more and more. There is not one day where you don't open the televisions or the radio where you don't hear about social polarization. And for me, it's linked to equity, diversity, and inclusion. And the third one, uh, of course, for us, it's indigenous reconciliation. Because, and we know we are not the only country with indigenous people, but it's not there. And if someone tells me, oh, it's part of equity, diversity, and inclusion, mm, not exactly. It's different uh, because indigenous people were there before we arrived. So we need to address this uh, very, very uh, differently. So questions to ask yourself. You remember at the beginning, I asked yourself to ask questions. And some of you uh, may be teacher or faculty. Uh, here or administrators. So some of the questions that you can ask yourself when you designed curriculum or when you develop wraparound services or you develop programs, who are you designing your programs for? And are you, are we creating opportunity for all? Is this program accessible? Meaning, is it as accessible if you live in an urban or rural area? Because if there are some programs that are only in urban areas, it's a problem, it's an issue. Second one, is the delivery method flexible? Women that may have a full-time job and a house to look after, kids to look after, sometimes a spouse to look after, I should not say that. I'm not nice, okay, when I say that. But, you know, is it available part-time, okay? Is it available online? And then the questions to ask ourselves, is internet accessible? Because often, we saw it during the pandemic, even in Canada, there were some areas where, guess what, they had a hard time. So colleges had to do a drive-in a drive-in is a place where normally you go to watch movie, but what they did, there was a drive-in parking where students could go download with the internet of the college and then go back where, where they live. But does that make sense? We don't, we need to have high-speed internet connections everywhere. We've been advocating that for our government they promised that in 10 years, but that's two years ago, so that in eight years, we would have it for everybody. We said, not good enough. You have to do it faster, because now it is an essential service. And the other thing is the, the opportunity or the program that you have, is it accessible to older students? So I'll tell you one, one thing that my country do wrong, and don't, don't think I don't love my country. I love my country. I just push my country to go further. But for us, we have some programs that some loans and bursaries that are not available if you're older than 30. What's wrong with this picture? We keep talking about lifelong learning, but you put a limit to the age of some programs. And if you want to study and get access to a scholarship, there's an age limit. Come on, that doesn't make sense. It, 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 it has to change. It has to change. Because uh, there should not be age uh, discrimination. So the other questions you have to ask yourself is, whose voice are represented in your classroom? is in your curriculum, in the books that you used. Do you see women? Do you see visible minorities? Do you see indigenous people? And if not, why do you use those books? You need to complement them or stop using those books because it means people do not recognize themselves. 
and do non-binary and gender, non-conforming individuals feel safe on your campus? Do they have a, a place to talk to? That's important. So, other questions to ask yourself. Is your program, does it lead to meaningful employment for vulnerable groups, or it ghettoize them? If it does, maybe you need to change the program or offer it differently so that it doesn't become a ghetto. Because as educators, everything should bring us back to the simple questions. Are we contributing to positive change for the world? That's what we need to ask ourselves. And so we think that it is important to be future-proof. My association is turning 50 this year. And you know what? When you turn 50, there is a certain maturity, wisdom that comes with it. And we, we decided uh, a year ago, before we turned 50, to sign the challenge that our government has done. And maybe you want to start that in Basque or, or in other parts of the world. It's called the 50-30 challenge. It means that 50% of your senior management and 50% of your board, if you have a board of directors, need to be gender equal. So 50% men, 50% women, and 30% representing different uh, groups. I'm pleased to report that at the board level, we signed it a year ago, and at the board level, we are meeting it and we have elections soon, so we hope we'll continue to, uh, to meet it, because if not, we'll do something about it. And uh, at my senior management, I'm short of an arm and a leg to meet the 50-30. I meet it at the gender, but not yet at the 30%. So, and the reasons why I say this is because more diversified you will be, better you will be as an organization. Because it means that you will be representative, it means that you will be able to serve the people in your commun communities. So as I end, my question to you is, are you ready? Are we ready? If not, what is missing? And how can we support each other in our collective journey. Merci, thank you, miigwech, gracias. Mikanen.